uh, I don't want to delay us any further, especially as we have a party waiting for us. So uh, far be it for me to keep anyone from a party. So welcome. Thanks for coming. And uh, before we get started, I just want to give uh, a big shout out to the organizers and to all of the participants of the conference. It's been a great uh, two days so far. So thank you guys for coming. And, and uh, it's been great. So really, I just wanted to make the people next door think that the talk was already over. So. <laughs> That was a fast talk. Um, so I have a confession to make to you. Uh, I am a failed Kanban coach. A few years ago, I had a very mission critical, um, very high profile engagement that I needed to take on. And it really needed to, to work. And uh, after much effort and uh, what I thought was my expertise, my daughter's task board uh, for her, her tasks, uh, my eight-year-old daughter, uh, the, the Kanban implementation failed. Uh, so fortunately, my wife uh, kept, my serv kept me on for other services. Uh, my daughter's now 12, and she's, she's OK. So it wasn't that catastrophic. But anyway, uh, it taught me a few things and, uh, and uh, humbled me as well. So anyway, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, the, the Kanban iceberg. So this is an experience that I've I've had uh, with my company Asynchrony in St. Louis, and I've had the interesting pleasure of having left Asynchrony, gone away for three years, and then returned. So about a year ago, I returned. And so it's an interesting experience. I don't know if any of you have had the experience of leaving a company and coming back to it some time later. You get to see what's changed, what's improved. Uh, but I was excited to see uh, what, what had happened in my absence uh, in addition to coming back to work with some passionate, talented people. Uh, Jason Tice is one of them. Uh, he's he's going to be talking tomorrow, or you're doing your uh, uh, workshop on games. So uh, I would commend that to you. But in addition to, to working with these people, I, I was uh, coming back to work with them. I wanted to see what had happened uh, with Kanban. So what I'm about to talk to you today about is the experience of seeing where the Kanban depth uh, had gone. So the structure of the talk is, is pretty basic. I'm going to talk to you about the Kanban iceberg, uh, simply a metaphor. And then I'll go into some depth about three of the values of Kanban in particular. So uh, I will stop for question breaks along the way to have a more continuous flow of questions so that we don't batch them up uh, at the end. Uh, I, I might not be managing the time well enough, so I don't know what my estimated uh, finishing time is. Uh, so anyway, so uh, Asynchrony is a uh, IT consulting firm in St. Louis. We do custom software delivery for our customers, uh, mobile apps, uh, web apps, systems, uh, everything in between. So we've got, at any given time, 30 to 35 project teams going under our, uh, our buildings. And so it's interesting because it's not a lot of, uh, it's, it's mostly independent teams working on independent uh, products. Uh, so they're small teams, cross-functional teams, mostly co-located. So I started with the company back in 2000. And uh, back then, it was a, a small startup. Or back then, we called them dot-coms. And uh, so we only had a few, a handful of people, 10 people or so. And what I would call, we were working in a proto-agile fashion. So. We hadn't really heard of Agile. It wasn't a thing uh, yet. And so we had small team. We had co-located team. We took whole team approach. We emphasized a lot of engineering practices that would come to be known as XP. So when we started doing our first official Agile projects uh, around 2004, 2005, we really had an emphasis on XP practices. Um, so over the years, uh, we've grown. and. We have taken on other parts of methodologies and, and frameworks. What I would consider proto Kanban back in around 2008. So almost personal Kanban applied at the team level. So visualizing work. Uh, but that was about it. So at this point, when I came back after a three year absence, uh, I, it was what I would consider ubiquitous Kanban. So every single team now is using some kind of card wall to visualize work. 
So we were doing all kinds of cool work, doing mobile apps and, and really cool stuff technology-wise. However, our Kanban depth hadn't really gone very far. So we were visualizing work. We were doing card walls. Um, but it wasn't really beyond that. There was no limiting uh, work in progress, for example. Um, and pull systems were still more of a theoretical thing than anything. So as a result, we've been doing card walls really well. We've been visualizing our work really well. But, uh, and we've got, I don't know, 12 or so different visualization tools, project management tools, um, but, and as well as physical card walls. But that's about the size of it. So, or the extent of it. So the idea is that visualizing work is one of the practices, the core practices of, of Kanban. But Kanban is much deeper than that. So I, I like to think of Kanban uh, as an iceberg. So how much of an iceberg is underwater? Anyone? 90? Yeah. Yeah, that's what, yeah exactly. So the, the mass of it is under the, under the surface. It's unseen. And so um, it's really not even the practices we're concerned about. David Anderson talks about how doing Kanban is not a question of the practice, but the intent. Um, so what, what are we doing it for? So card wall is what we see. Uh, that's the exposed part. Um, but there are other practices, some of which are seen, some of which are, you might say, sensed, uh, making policies explicit. Uh, and you've probably seen these before. So I won't go into great depth about the practices. You've probably heard of the principles as well. I won't go into depth here either, because I'd like to just quickly go through the values. And so these are uh, the values as they've come to be known in the community. And of these particular things, I think they're, they're important because they help us understand the why. The, the, if, you, if you know the start with the why approach, this is really what it's about in terms of what we need culturally. Um, so I do want to mention, so Mike Burroughs is the one who first put these forth. And it was very, his, his writing, his blog, his, his book, uh, Kanban from the Inside, I think it's available out there actually, was very instrumental in my thinking here. And he asks uh, s some questions that were really relevant to our organizations, our, our organization. Could Kanban style transparency and balance provide some relief where people are still overburdened? Is your collaboration focused mostly inwardly? Does customer focus suffer uh, as a result of overprotective intermediation around the team? Um, so some of these things really resonated with me when I was thinking about why or why, why hadn't we gotten deeper with, with Kanban at Asynchrony. So rather than starting at the top, which we were already doing really well, I wanted to get to the bottom. And so this is the, the main message that I wanted to convey. Kanban isn't about card walls. Yes, it's, it includes card walls, but it's about safe evolutionary change. Card walls are the, the means to the end, and not the end themselves. Um, so back to the original question then. How do, we, how do we help teams for whom Kanban is, is merely uh, card walls? In, in our practice, uh, we had forgotten, or in some cases, even not even really known in the first place, what the purpose of Kanban was. So uh, any questions so far before I launch into what we did with some of the values? OK. All right, so uh, I'll focus on some things we did to promote, emphasize understanding. So understanding is understanding the system, the people in the system, the purpose of the system the why of the system. So one of the first things to understand is, what, what is this word that gets bandied about? So uh, if you're familiar with Agile, I think Agile's gone through this, this phase whereby it's so overburdened with connotations and everyone has a different meaning for Agile. I think at this point, it's very similar with, with the word Kanban. So I've been able to think through at least three different connotations that I've heard people using Kanban for. I don't know if any of these ring true to you as well. Uh, one is simply card wall, visualizing work. 
The second is, is the idea um, uh, set in opposite of time boxed delivery, or at least commitment to delivery, and it's the continuous flow delivery model, or commitment to work on an individual item level as opposed to a batch level, which is what we have in, in sprint uh, commitments. And then there's a third connotation, which is what I would consider the, the broader understanding of, of the Kanban method, uh, which is the evolutionary improvement framework. So who, who uses the first, uh, the, the doors on there are kind of re reverse, reverse number, but who uses the term Kanban to refer to card wall? No one? You can choose multiple answers, by the way. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, what about number two? Continuous flow delivery model, okay. And what about three? All right, and what about all three? All of the above. Okay, yeah. So it's important because uh, as I was approaching people and talking about Kanban, I was tending to think about Kanban in the, in the last one, the evolutionary um, change uh, framework. And so a lot of people were only thinking about it in the first level and we were talking past each other. So understanding, at least to start with, what the terms are is important. So I mentioned Mike's uh, work in, in the values. And so one of the things that, that really interested me is, is how to use the values to communicate and educate people about what Kanban was. And so he has, um, he's developed a, an assessment framework for this. And so uh, I would commend that to you. You can see it on his blog. He's written about it in the book. Uh, basically, it uses those values. And uh, he actually groups a few of them together. So it ends up being only um, six uh, areas, transparency, balance, customer focus, et cetera. And he, he provides a, a framework for asking questions of, of the team or of, the, of a system or a service. How do, how, are you, how do you feel you're doing in these areas? And so um, one of our first experiments was to approach some teams and say, hey, would you like, a, would you like to do this, this assessment thing? It's a new thing. Uh, it might be interesting uh, to get, it, get some feedback on how things are going with, with regard to your Kanban uh, depth. And so at first, we we had a little team of, of coaches going in and we were going to assess these, these teams and tell them what, what their scores were. We had had some experience with CMMI a few years ago and so the idea of like an outside assessor team was, was uh, in our minds. And so it became very, very apparent to us early that why don't we let the team assess itself and, and rather than have this, this oppositional team coming in to, to grade you or judge you, if, if this is truly about respecting people and allowing the team to own the change, we'll let the team decide uh, what they score. So yeah, the downside was that they might not be quite so honest with themselves, but we figured that was worth the, the uh, trade-off. So, uh, so that's from this idea, the, the metaphor of the Kanban uh, iceberg uh, came, came up. Uh, incidentally, Pavel uh, Brodzinski also uh, uses this metaphor. You can read about some of his writing on his blog. So there's a measurement scale for, uh, for the assessment. So from uh, one to four, and we let the teams grade themselves. So David talks about how, how we try to avoid resistance and, and anticipate emotional resistance, the idea of flowing around the rocks. So this was allowing the teams to own their own assessments was really helpful in, in that way. Um, so I'm going to go through these quickly uh, in respect to your time. So uh, we used Mike's book. It came out last fall, and uh, it, didn't, it couldn't arrive soon enough. It was really helpful for helping us understand the values themselves better. And even in the process of going through the assessments, it was educational. Some of the teams, one of the areas talks about making policies explicit. And uh, you may have heard the excuse, well, our tool doesn't allow us to make policies explicit. And so I, I, they were already familiar with the uh, manifesto uh, value of uh, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So I, I, I told them that they couldn't uh, blame their tool. And so they ended up posting some of their uh, entry or exit criteria or just general policies on their, on their monitor with uh, post-it notes. Um, so the initial f feedback was positive. So 
people at least appreciated that there was some interest in helping them equip them uh, with understanding Kanban a little more deeply. Uh, and it gave us a shared language for talking about Kanban too. So rather than just saying Kanban is card walls, now there was some, there was some, some profundity to the idea of Kanban. So here's one team's result. Basically, there was, there was a non-judgmental uh, scoring system. We, we just said, what's the area you feel that you'd want to improve in over the next month? And so this team, uh, they, they'd scored lowest in flow. Now it doesn't have to be the lowest one, uh, but they, they wanted to improve flow by a point. So our goal was to make a, a one, one point improvement in that area. Uh, so this is another one, another team. They felt weakest in transparency. So, uh, so what's next after this? So teams had some assessments done. They had some idea of what uh, they were meant to be doing with Kanban, but they're still very busy. They're busy delivering, and a lot of people just don't want to focus on, on the, the bigger picture of, of what is this Kanban method you speak of. Uh, so uh, that leads to flow, uh, another one of the values. So what is flow? Daniel Vacanti describes it as the movement and delivery of customer value through a process. Uh, and Mike Burroughs uh, talks about how fast, smooth flow means our system is both creating value quickly, which is minimizing risk, and avoiding cost of delay, and is also doing so in a predictable fashion. So those are great definitions. However, most people think of flow and they think, ah, metrics. So I had a conversation the other day, a uh, lead developer on the team said, I don't care about metrics, which is another way of just saying, let me alone, I like to develop software and I'm good at that, you can do your metrics. So not everybody needs to care about metrics of flow. However, the whole team should understand and care about flow itself. So, um, so we're a really flat organization. So there's basically a few executive managers and everybody else delivering software uh, on teams. So flat organizations are really good in lots of ways. For Kanban to work, David's talked about how it's best catalyzed at the middle management level. Well, guess what? We don't have middle managers. So how do we, how do we catalyze uh, Kanban in, in this uh, context? So David talks about how bottom-up initiatives tend to stall with only local improvements and boards that are best described as team or personal Kanban. So we weren't going to add a, a whole middle management level uh, to our organization just for the, for the purpose of flow. So we tried an experiment. We're still experimenting with the, the role of flow manager. So we got this idea from, uh, from Chris uh, Achuance in uh, Europe who wrote about this. And basically it's someone to catalyze the change uh, in the teams. So, um, so what would you say you do as flow manager? <laughs> so uh, the purpose is to make the team, help the team reflect and act help it follow the policies that it's created, create new ones when needed, uh, discuss, discuss and act on exceptions, try experiments to find creative solutions to things, and generally inspire, coach, and challenge the team. So uh, there were some, some metrics that would help the flow manager role. Uh, so as a way of defining some things, so a lot of people use cycle time, I prefer to use delivery time. It relates to a simple concept most people can understand, which is delivery. And so that delivery time is simply the time between your commitment point, when you say, yes, we're going to commit to starting this work and finishing this work, to the delivery point, however it's defined by the team. Everything in the middle, in between that, is work in progress, uncommitted work. Okay, so uh, some other metrics. Uh, so delivery time, uh, as well as delivery uh, rate, uh, which is uh, from that. Percent com complete and accurate. So this is a, a process quality metric. The number of times, the rate at which a work item goes through your process without uh, defect, rework, or blockage. Uh, flow efficiency, uh, you guys may have heard some other people talking about that earlier, that's, that's the amount of value added work time over the total time of a work item. And then return on investment. So which of these do you guess is the hardest to pin down? 
Which one? Return on yeah, return on investment. Yeah, that's the notoriously most uh, difficult one. It was for us as well. Uh, so uh, one of the things we did in this flow manager experiment was, was work with a team. They, in order to capture these metrics, they needed to redesign their work tickets. So they were working in a, a physical uh, board. And thankfully, we do have tools these days, so of which you've seen this week, that allow this to be automated, which was one of the biggest pains of this system here. Um, so this team's work board was literally so old and unchanged that I had to get some industrial strength uh, uh, spray to get the, uh, the, the, the uh, words off the board. Uh, it hadn't been changed in months. Uh, and as a result, it wasn't reflecting what their current process was. So they were just, they were just going along with what, whatever was on the board. I had to use a razor blade to peel off these little black lines that were in between the, the uh, lanes. Um, but this, this board, uh, well, this team had six people on it. And they had 50 items in progress. But part of the problem was that these, these work tickets were stacked onto each other. And so it was hard to see, <laughs> hard to see just how many uh, items in progress they had going. So th th beware of the, the ticket stacking anti-pattern uh, for WIP. Uh, so we redesigned their board to make it reflect what they were doing today. And so it became a little simpler. So we started tracking delivery time over a few months. With the data we had, we figured out it was around 10 days. So these teams, this team was working in a, a weekly demo uh, cadence, but because of hangover and, and stories that wouldn't finish within that period, their, their uh, delivery time was 10 days. But that was only to demo. So the time to production in the, the three-month experiment that we ran for this flow manager, they, they didn't once commit anything to production. And so if we want to think about our delivery time extended to production, that was um, infinite. Percent complete and accurate, we didn't have good data here. And so it, it was, we were unable to make any kind of assessment. Flow efficiency, I think David has written that uh, the range typically that he's seen is like 15 to 30 percent, somewhere around there. Is that right? Lower than that? OK, yeah. I know someone was, you had like a really high one. Um, or no? <laughs> OK, well, anyway. But this team was 9 percent, which uh, didn't seem like it was all that great. So, but at least it gave them some feedback about what was going on. And so uh, I, I mentioned this to them, and, and they, had, they said, well, we're, when we're working on our stuff, we're working on it. And then we, we, we throw it over to the QA, and the QA works on it. Well, this, this one fellow, they, they, had, they had no sense of limiting their work in progress. And so I said, well, you know, it'd probably be better for you if you didn't even do any work, if you didn't start any new work, and let the QA finish up what you were already stacking on his queue. And, and he said, well, I'd get fired if I stopped working. And thankfully, about that time, and this is why having a flat organization is, is nice sometimes, our, our CTO came by. And I said, oh, hey, hey, come, come here. Can you come with me? And, and we, we went over and talked to this, this guy on the team. And I said, hey, if, if he stopped pulling off new work so that he wouldn't overburden the QA, would you fire him? <laughs> and, and he said, absolutely not. That's exactly what you should be doing. Actually, he should be helping with the QA work. But it was an eye-opening experience for him because it, it was a uh, totally, totally new concept. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Right. Yeah, we tracked, it. We, we tracked it over time. So the number of, and this is why the, the, the physical tickets were not really great. But uh, basically, the, the amount of hours that the, the team worked on a, a particular piece of the, the work, and then over the total delivery time. So, and they were writing it by hand on the cards. Yeah. So it was subject to some error there. And again, that's why I'm, I'm looking forward to these tools, because they're, they can help us do these things automatically. Uh, and again, we, we didn't get a return on investment number. So, uh, but uh, I want to say this: visibility leads to conversation, and so visualizing their work in progress properly uh, it leads to understanding, which leads to change. But someone needs to start the conversation. And that's why we saw the, the role of the flow manager uh, being helpful here. Psychologists use the, the term "extinguish uh, bad habits," which implies a, a more gradual 
uh, approach to, to changing things. Um, so in the course of this, a lot of our teams, it's been a long-standing pattern to do stand-up meetings. Uh, but some of them get stale as, as they do over time. And you know, Scrum gives us the helpful three questions. So uh, again, Mike had, had some thoughts around what leadership looks like in a, in a Kanban environment. And uh, so, the, so I would propose these three new questions, uh, or uh, new three questions. How can we improve flow today? What is blocked and why? And where are bottlenecks forming? So this, this really focuses the team on flow and orients the discussion at stand up toward that end. OK, so some takeaways. Make the metrics highly visible, reliable, meaningful. Help the team understand that they're, they're for their own good. And, and give them something to, to improve upon. Uh, we really felt like the flow manager should be part of the team because if it's an outside person, only spending a, a few minutes a day with the team, it feels like an outside auditor or some, some nanny checking up on the team, at least in our context. And so we really feel like the, the flow manager needs to be integrated as part of the team, as, a, as a, someone who's supporting the team, not checking in on them. OK, so moving on uh, to blockers. So uh, thank you guys all for coming to this session, because I know Klaus is talking about blockers over there. So I'm going to give you a little taste of, of blockers. Uh, not, the, not the real deal, uh, but uh, just a little taste. So uh, this is a technique popularized by, uh, by Klaus and, and Troy McGinnis. Uh, it, it, it leverages a Kanban system to identify the systematic uh, occurrence of, of blockers and quantify the cost of, of blockers. Uh, so the idea is that blockers are not isolated events, but there's some kind of systematic uh, reason or cause behind them. OK, so, so I offered this as a, a safe to fail experiment for some teams. I said, hey, the first, first three team leads that come to me, I'll help you guys do blocker clustering. Um, and so uh, my instructions to the teams were uh, talk with your teammates about it, define block, uh, just like it's important to define what delivery points are, define what a block is. Um, if, it's, if it's in the backlog it's, and you're not committed to it yet, it probably isn't blocked. I mean, you can't, you can't commit to it, but it's not, you haven't committed to the work yet. So it's not necessary to, to call it a blocker. Um, and then figure out some way to instrument your system so you can track the data. The most important things are being the, the reason behind it and the, and the duration. Uh, so we got started, and so the team, they were using JIRA, but they just found it easier to go analog style and put stickies on the board. Uh, and so uh, they, they grouped them as they went in internal and external. And then after a month, we got together and did a blocker analysis session. Uh, so it was a small team, and so the whole team attended. And they grouped them further into uh, s smaller areas under internal and external. And so from there, we added up all the, uh, the days of blockage for each, each category and the number of items uh, in them. For the ones that were most egregious uh, internal blockers, we did a fishbone style. Um, I drew this. My fish mode is, needs some work, obviously. But um, uh, so that the team could go a little further into some root cause analysis on, on, on the internal ones. So this is what the team found. So internal ones were 20, 20 days worth of delay. External were 147, basically uh, waiting on customer, or customer services for things. Um, and the biggest one was 86 days. And so basically, based on the number of days and the rate of occurrence of those blockers, we were able to pose this question uh, to the customer. You have a 75% chance each week of creating a blocker that costs you an average of 29 days. Is this acceptable to you? Uh, it, it, may, it may be acceptable, uh, um, depending. But um, So it at least gives you some quantifiable way of having a conversation and making decisions about it. Uh, okay, uh, another example, this team used Mingle uh, to do it. They did it more in an automated way. But the, the problem there was that they, most of their blockers were unknown reason. They forgot to, uh, to select the reason. And so there's a lot of wasted uh, opportunity here. Uh, okay, so learnings from this, important to understand your commitment point. Uh, you, may, you may sort them differently. Uh, these teams just sorted them uh, in external, internal. And, uh, and then, like I said, be, be diligent about collecting the data properly. OK. And, and finally, I'd like to focus a, a little bit on the values of 
collaboration and balance. There's a little bit of customer focus in here and leadership in here, but uh, two is sufficient. So you've heard of the, the, the feedback loops, or uh, some people call them the Kanban Kata, Kanban cadences. We have traditionally, well, we've, we've traditionally done the stand-up meetings and retrospectives. We've done them very well. It's been a routine part of how our teams work. Two years ago, roughly, we introduced the idea of operations review. It seemed like a good idea. Um, however, we've, we've struggled with, a little, with that a little bit, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. So, like I said, we do stand-up meetings uh, pretty well. Uh, these are some teams. Uh, this is in the morning. Some teams have it stand up at the same time. Uh, retrospectives, we have a, a group of, uh, I call them lay facilitators, basically people on, who are actually usually in delivery teams who also want to help other teams do uh, facilitation work and, and, and they facilitate other teams' retrospectives. So we've trained them and uh, they go, they, they're not, they're not full-time facilitators, but they are trained to do their work. Um, and so the operations review uh, started a couple years ago and there was some value in it. This is from one team lead. The most valuable thing about this meeting is the fact that it's a venue for sharing ex experimental practices and judging how well they worked or didn't. So it's, me it's basically been a meeting of the, our team leads and they, they share experiments that they've been doing uh, or at least some kind of quantifiable way of, of managing things. But it's more like people on different mountaintops just telling each other what they're doing. And uh, how are things on your mountain? Uh, without really caring about what it's like on my, my mountain. So the, the pros are that we got people thinking about objective uh, measurements and, and, and data, some lightweight peer accountability. The cons were that there was no real, it wasn't really a, a problem solving oriented meeting, um, like what I understand uh, operations review to be. And there was no higher level of feedback loop closure. So, um, so we're still doing these, these experiments. We're actually calling them a science fair, <laughs> a monthly science fair, where people are just free to, to share what they're, they're doing in their teams. But uh, we need something beyond, so something at the higher level beyond this retrospective. So we're re rethinking what, what our operations reviews are, are going to be meant to be. Um, so, one of the ways that we found to help people learn about Kanban as an iceberg and think about the values and some of the deeper um, principles is to introduce things early on. So starting at the start, we just uh, got a batch of interns uh, to start the summer. And so we did an inception with them for their projects. And so we had them think through what, what are the cadences that you want to be using as you guys deliver your, your work this summer. Um, so you can see we're, we're starting uh, with them, getting that introduced into the organization. And almost immediately, we had uh, good feedback. So it's, it's great when you see veteran programmers and team leads being inspired to do things by the interns. So this is, this is, just a, this is last week, actually. Uh, so uh, the, we had had a, a, a company-wide showcase of the inception that the interns did, and a lot of people came to that. And this, uh, this guy is a team lead and was inspired to learn more. So that was really exciting. So it's an ed ongoing education process. Um, you know, Dragos uh, mentioned the different hats you might wear. So uh, I, I wear the hat of, of coach, consultant, mentor, and trainer. And so depending on what people are needing, I have to figure out what hat to be wearing. Uh, so it's nice in this way to be in able to introduce things to people and have them uh, learning and be interested in it. So some, some takeaways. So my, my goal is, is for people to be, to enjoy work and to be satisfied with what they're doing and uh, to enjoy it. And so part of that is obviously some of the, the things about uh, not overburdening teams. And, and you know, when I hear about teams who are laden with a whole bunch of work because they can't really see what's going on uh, it makes me sad. And so the one team going from 50 work items in progress to down to 12 was a start. Um, we're seeing some greater sensitivity to the system. Uh, it's still not great, it's still not, there's not widespread uh, WIP limits. There are, there are starting to be some WIP limits, 
However, a whip limit doesn't necessarily mean you're obeying the whip limit. It's like the, the great Jerry Seinfeld uh, sketch about the, uh, the rental car company you know, taking the reservation, but not holding the reservation. Holding the reservation is really the most important part. Obeying the whip limit is the most important part. But they're getting there. Um, so, uh, and teams are thinking about improving flow. So that's now part of the conversation happening. Teams thinking about, well, if we have a separate code review stage in our workflow, that means that there's a handoff. And that means that it's going to interrupt flow. So maybe we bake that code review into uh, the, the development process uh, more uh, integrated. Um, so this is a, an iceberg that is flipped. Has anybody ever seen something like this? Uh, it's really fascinating. It, it's beautiful. And the photo, you, it's, um, I, you can get it on the Wall Street Journal, uh, their website. It's a beautiful, brilliant image. But the idea is that uh, icebergs do tend to flip. And so uh, using this metaphor, I want to encourage you guys to flip the iceberg. It, you know, over a period of time, I think it's just a few weeks, this iceberg here will get covered over with snow and, and uh, debris again. But to clean off and, and, and clear off some of the stuff that, so we, we can get a more brilliant manifestation of, of Kanban in our world uh, would be uh, really cool. And so um, some of the things I mentioned have been helpful. Uh, the assessment, uh, you've heard, probably heard the, the static. I think someone mentioned it yesterday, the systems thinking approach to, to Kanban and uh, to introducing Kanban. Uh, thinking about the, the values. I mentioned education or understanding is low friction. That's really helpful. And so um, also trying experiments. So one of the nice things about where I work is that experiments are pretty easy to, to pull off. They may be easy to pull off in your world too, but uh, encourage you guys to just try safe to fail experiments and seeing if any of these things might be helpful for you. So uh, thank you. Uh, I'll take some questions now. And uh, I, I brought some of these posters. So you guys, I should have told you that at the beginning. You could have just taken the poster and left. Uh, but there's some posters back there. But any, any questions? Oh, yeah, sure, Showcase. Uh, I use Showcase uh, interchangeably with Demo. It's basically a, a group uh, demonstration of, of the work. So in this case, it was the interns. They'd had a two-day inception, and so they just did a presentation to the company what, what all they, they had decided to do and how they were going to be working. I was just curious about the... Um the blockers you mentioned, uh, average 75% chance of hitting a blocker that costs you some days. Oh, yeah. Um, when you presented that to senior management, it, if, if you're presenting that to me, I would say, okay, uh, give me three options and tell me how much they'll cost. Right? If it costs a million dollars to solve that, then you know what? That blocker is just fine. Right. If it costs me not much, then maybe... Yeah. But, but did, you, did you go through that process? Yeah, so I encouraged the team to take that to the customer, their, their, the product owner who was on the customer end. And I think that they were, they were such in, in dire straits with wanting to deliver and focus on the release that they it went in one ear and out the other. But you're absolutely right. That's the, that's the way to think about that. And what, what is the actual cost of, of correcting this thing? So and that, that's, the, that's the great benefit of blocker analysis. others all right well thank you I'll see you at the uh, at the party soon right yeah thank you <laughs>